Shall we turn in our Bibles now to Acts chapter 20? And tonight we begin with verse 13. Paul is on his way back to Jerusalem. He is taking a offering that he has collected from the Gentile churches to help the church in Jerusalem because they've gone through some real financial problems. And uh, Paul is hoping that by bringing to them an offering from the Gentile churches, it will help break down some of the prejudice that the Jewish church had about Gentiles. One of the hardest things in the world to break is that of traditions. And uh, it was just a, a tradition, really, the, the feelings that the Jews had toward the Gentiles, that uh, a sense that the Gentiles could not be saved. Uh, according to some of the rabbis, God created the Gentiles to fuel the fires of hell. And uh, they felt that the only way you could be saved was to be a Jew. And so Paul is trying to break down this prejudice. As he wrote to the Ephesians, Christ has broken down that wall that once ex separated us. And uh, talking about uh, the unity of the body of Christ. And uh, it isn't a thing of ethnics. It's a thing of just we are all one in him, as Paul said where there is neither Jew nor Greek, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free. Christ is all and in all. And he's hoping to sort of get this message across by bringing a generous offering from the Gentile churches uh, to show their love for the church in Jerusalem and for the Jews. Uh, he is on his way back. He has come from Philippi, uh, Luke joins with him in coming across to Troas. They spend about a week in Troas, and now they begin their journey again toward Jerusalem. And in the next few verses here, uh, we have uh, sort of the, uh, just, you know, if you take a map, a Bible map uh, of that area, uh, you can uh, follow then uh, each day making uh, a little bit further uh, on their journey back. But uh, Paul tells us that, I mean, Luke tells us that Paul is quite anxious uh, to get to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And so it's a five-day journey from Troas over to uh or to Miletus from uh, uh, Philippi. And uh, then they go from Troas to Miletus. And uh, that's another five-day journey, but Luke tells us each port they stopped at in the evening. Uh, but on the first leg of this trip, if you have a map again, you'll see that uh, from... Uh, from Troas there, there's a sort of a peninsula that goes out quite a ways. And it is about 30 miles uh, from uh, Troas to Assos uh, if you take it by ship because you have to go around this uh, point. Uh, it's about 20 miles walking straight across. So Paul decided to walk while the others took the ship. Perhaps just to do some real meditation. You know, it's interesting how walking just sort of is a great way to meditate. Uh, you get away from the phone and other distractions. And, and it's just a great way to just meditate. Now, Paul is being warned everywhere he goes that there's real trouble ahead. When he gets to Jerusalem, there's going to be nothing but trouble for him. The Spirit of God is warning Paul everywhere he goes. 
there is that warning of the Spirit of the trouble that awaits him in Jerusalem. Now, way back in the beginning, when first Paul was called, the Lord said that he was going to show Paul the things that he was going to suffer or have to suffer for the gospel's sake. So now the Lord is warning Paul. I don't think that the Lord is saying, don't go to Jerusalem. Some people interpret it that way. I don't see it that way. I see it as just this is what God said he would do. He would tell Paul of the things that he would have to suffer for the kingdom of God's sake. And so the Lord is just letting him know there's trouble ahead, Paul. When you get to Jerusalem, it's not going to be an easy thing. And so the warning of that Paul is receiving from the Spirit everywhere he goes of the trouble that awaits him there in Jerusalem. So I think that perhaps he wanted to just sort of think things through. And uh, walking again, a great way of just meditating, thinking, uh, and, and seeking guidance. Quite often when I really want to hear from the Lord, I try to just get alone, take a walk, and just commune with the Lord while walking. And so he's taking this 20-mile walk. I've never done that. But uh, he's uh, wanting to uh, just, you know, get some guidance and direction directly from the Lord. So th he met them there at Asos. Uh, it took him a day to uh, walk it. It took them a day to go around. And uh, he probably also felt, I'm going to be on the ship for a long time, you know, and, and it would be good to just get out and do some walking. It wasn't like being on a cruise liner where you could walk around the deck, you know, every day. He's going to be on a smaller ship and going to be in confined quarters. And so felt probably just good to get a good long walk before I, you know, spend so much time on the ship. So, uh, from Asos, uh, they came the next day to Mytilene, which is a seaport on the island of Lesbos. Actually, they're not really touching the mainland for a few days, but uh, there are several islands that are not too far off from the mainland, and uh, they are actually coming onto these islands. Uh, the next day they passed by the island of Chios, and the following day they passed by the island of Samos, and then they anchored at Trogilium, which of course is on the mainland, and uh, it's about a mile from Samos, which is uh, an island offshore, real close to the shore. The next day they sailed on to Miletus, and uh, Miletus was a large port city, and uh, it was probably here that they would take the provisions uh, for their journey uh, because soon uh, they will be uh, on the open sea, so to speak, uh, on their way to uh, Syria. So uh, when Paul is here, rather than he, he passed by Ephesus, because to get to Ephesus, you'd have to go way up into the bay and back out again. Paul didn't feel that he had that kind of luxury of time uh, to go up to Ephesus. And so he's going to uh, call for the elders of the church in Ephesus to come and meet him there at Miletus. It's about a 30-mile distance from Ephesus to Miletus. But he asked the elders of the church to come and meet him there. And uh, so we have recorded here Paul's talk with the elders. Verse 17 from Miletus. He sent to Ephesus, called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia... After what manner I have been with you in all seasons. He's going to talk to them now about his ministry. You fellows know 
how that from the first day that I came to Asia, my ministry among you, what manner I have been with you in all seasons. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, be an example of the believer. And this should always be the case. A pastor should not just tell people the way, but he should lead them in the way. And he should show them by example the way of life. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, follow me even as I also follow Jesus Christ. Again to the Corinthians, Paul wrote, for our rejoicing is this. The testimony of our conscience is that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our manner of living in the world and more abundantly toward you, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things proving ourselves the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watching, in fasting, by the pureness of knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, and by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Now Paul is describing the way he lived among the people. He's describing how that he sought not to be an offense in anything because he didn't want people blaming the ministry. And so he did his best to live a very circumspect life before them, to show much patience in afflictions and in the necessities, that the needs, and even in distresses. And all of the things that he endured for the gospel's sake. Again, to the Thessalonians, Paul wrote, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor of guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tries our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is my witness, nor of men did we seek glory, and neither from you, nor yet of others, that we might have, though we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishing her children. So because we loved you so deeply, we were willing to impart to you not the gospel of God only, but our own souls, because you were dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and our travail, for we labored night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you that we might freely preach unto you the gospel of God. And you are witnesses, and God also, of how holy and righteous and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you 
that believe. Quite a remarkable man, this man Paul. What an example he is for all ministers or all who would serve the Lord. Not seeking his own glory, but only seeking the glory of Jesus Christ to be revealed to the people. To Timothy, he said, you have fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my charity, or my love and my patience. Timothy, you know these things the way I live. You've seen it. It's so wonderful. When a person lives the life before you. And Paul is basically saying to these elders from Ephesus, you know, you have seen, you've been able to observe the way I lived among you. Uh, just like he lived everywhere he went. Uh, not with deceiving, not deceiving or seeking to deceive, not with uh, anything but just a great compassion and love for those that he was ministering to. Paul had declared, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that really just sort of sums up his life. To live was Christ. He had no other purpose for living except to just live for the Lord. He said, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, in one place, writing to the Corinthians, he said, you force me to, to sort of glory. And so, if any man has whereof to boast, I more. He wrote that to the Philippians. But Paul only wanted to bring glory to Jesus Christ. He wasn't interested in personal glory for himself. He said, and when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. His life was bound up in Christ. He is our life. For me to live is Christ. That was, that was the whole essence of the life of Paul. Would to God, we had more men in the pulpits today like Paul. Paul then described his ministry to them. He said, serving the Lord with humility of mind. It was not an attitude like, you're so blessed to have me as your pastor. <laughs> but I'm so blessed to have you in my congregation, to have any congregation. He always saw himself as serving the Lord. And I think that this is very important for anyone who is in the ministry to realize that we are serving the Lord. And I see myself as serving the Lord. And what I do, I do for the Lord. Not for the rewards of man, not for the applause of man, not for the... Uh, recognition or acknowledgement of man because oftentimes that doesn't come. Paul, though, writing to the Corinthians said, your labor for the Lord is never in vain. And uh, he was serving the Lord and he wasn't looking for rewards from man. He was looking for his reward to come to him directly from the Lord. He said, I've fought a good fight. I've finished the course I've kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord our righteous judge shall give to me. And that's what he was looking for. To stand before the Lord and to receive the approval of the Lord. He said that he didn't really seek to please man. He sought to please the Lord. Because if I am striving to please men, then he said I would not be a servant of Christ. And so... Seeing himself as serving the Lord. It's much easier to please the Lord than often to please man. 
Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But the yoke that men will put on you many times is very heavy and the burden is heavy. He speaks of his ministry to them not only as serving the Lord with all humility of mind, but with many tears and temptations. I think of that psalm that says, He that goes forth with weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves. The temptation that Paul refers to here is actually the trials that he went through, especially from the Jews who were always plotting against him. Several plots against his life were made by the Jews. It seems like his life was in constant jeopardy and danger because of the great feelings of the Jews against Paul because of his ministry to the Gentiles and and the gospel that he brought to the Gentiles. But also in the last chapter there in Ephesus, Paul had that tremendous trial when Demetrius, the silversmith, stirred up the riot in Ephesus because Paul was actually, through his preaching and through the results of Paul's ministry, uh, his trade was in danger. They made little uh, idols and uh, replicas of the Temple of Diana that people would take. And they, uh, Paul was saying that, you know, Diana isn't a real God and that you don't make gods with hands and his business was falling off and so he created that ruckus and uh, Paul's life again was in jeopardy. Uh, Paul spoke about uh, fighting the wild beast in Ephesus and so he is saying to them, you know the things that I've gone through. You know the temptations which the word would probably better be translated trials you know those trials that I had while I was there in Ephesus and uh, yet he said I held nothing back from you that might be profitable to you didn't hold anything back gave himself completely and fully for them that was Paul's modus operandi, wherever he went, to everyone that he ministered to, he gave himself totally to those that he was ministering to. He wrote to the Corinthians, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Those aren't just words. That was Paul's heart. That was his feeling. I'll be glad to just give myself fully for you. And then he said, I have shown you and I have taught you. Not only did Paul teach them the scriptures, but he lived out the scriptures before them. His life was a living epistle. He had exhorted Timothy to be an example of the believer and he himself sought to be an example of the believer. There's an old adage that says that actions speak louder than words. And sometimes our actions drown out our words. We must always seek to practice what we preach if we want people to practice what we preach. You can't say one thing and be another and have people give any credibility to your word. 
Your life needs to be a living demonstration of the things that you preach. It's awfully hard to preach love and kindness and long-suffering and patience if you're constantly flying off the handle. Because people say, well, wait a minute, you know. If it doesn't work in your life, how can I be assured that it's going to work in my life? And so Paul is saying to them that I have shown you. And that's so important. Because people learn by example. They learn by seeing it. They see it worked out in a person's life. And then I have taught you. But the teaching becomes very relevant because the life behind it backs up the teaching. What I say is important. But oftentimes what a person says is totally lost to the hearer because of what the person is. There has to be the living demonstration to really give the emphasis to the things that are being taught. Paul is saying, I taught you and I showed you publicly and from house to house. So, There in Ephesus, Paul was in the school of Tyrannus. And every afternoon he was teaching in the school of Tyrannus. Publicly. But then Paul also ministered from house to house. There was that personal ministry of Paul. God have mercy on the minister who is so enamored by the crowds that he cannot take time for the individual. Jesus was never too busy for individuals. And if a minister becomes so great that he can no longer take time for an individual, he has become greater than his Lord. If you will look at the Gospels again, you will find that some of the greatest sermons that Jesus preached were preached not to the multitudes, but to the individuals. In fact, we don't really find many great sermons to the multitudes. Even the Sermon on the Mount was given to a select few. Seeing the multitudes... He went up into a mountain and when he sat down his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and he taught them, not the multitude, the disciples saying, blessed. And he began the Sermon on the Mount, not to multitudes, but to the disciples. It was to Nicodemus that Jesus taught the importance of being born again. It was to Nicodemus that He gave that scripture that is really the heart of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That wasn't spoken to the multitudes. That was spoken to an individual, Nicodemus, as he shared with them the extent of God's love for lost mankind. It was to the woman of Samaria that Jesus talked about that water of life that he could give, that if a man would drink of it, he would never thirst again, but it would be like a well of living water springing up within. And that great message of Jesus was to that woman there by the well. And so Paul, following the example of his master, taught publicly, but also from house to house. The private ministry of Paul, the personal ministry of Paul, that personal contact that Paul had with the people as individuals. And again, how important that is for the minister 
and for the ministry. So, next week, we will get into the message that Paul was teaching them. And uh, then, as he shares with them his going to Jerusalem and the warnings that he is receiving uh, of his imprisonment and all that will come to him there. And uh, this, of course, this really is a message for those that are involved in the ministry. But every one of you should be involved in the ministry. Some ministry. Now, not all of you should be in the pulpit, but some ministry. God has a purpose and a plan for each one of your lives. And we need to discover that. We need to fulfill it. Just before the service, I did receive a um, notification that our pastor who pastors the Fallbrook and the Winslow churches, he pastors them both, they're small churches, his home went up in flames today in that great Arizona fire. So uh, as Paul collected from uh, the Gentile churches for the poor brethren in Jerusalem, uh, I think that uh, it would only be proper, as God lays upon your heart, uh, to uh, perhaps help uh, that pastor who lost his home. Uh, we'll uh, set up a fund here at Calvary. If you would like to just contribute to it, you can just put on it uh, fire, and we'll, <laughs> that's all you need to put. We'll know what you're talking about. And... Uh, will try to help him. Again, you know, if you spread it over a, a lot of people, uh, it, it just uh, doesn't make a hardship on where, where just one person, it's a tremendous hardship. If we can spread it out over many of us, uh, it will help him tremendously. And I know that uh, it's just a token of our love uh, for them, they're in Arizona that have suffered such a tremendous loss uh, with this horrendous fire that is going on right now. Uh, the newspaper called me today and wanted to know uh, what I felt about the California uh, Supreme Court uh, <laughs> voting uh, against uh, the use of the Pledge of Allegiance uh, to the flag in our public schools. And uh, they have declared that it is unconstitutional and uh, that it cannot be recited in the public schools in California. Uh, that's so typical of uh, the present uh, legislation and, and uh I mean, it's just, it's unthinkable. I mean, uh, are they all going to quit spending money? Uh, it <laughs> says, in God we trust. Uh, it should be unconstitutional. And so, uh, uh, how ridiculous and how far can we get uh, from uh, the foundations upon which our nation was built? It's a tragic... Uh, kind of a, a thing that's happening. But uh, I would not be surprised to find that the Supreme Court will uh, overrule this decision of the liberal court here in California. But uh, it's, it's something we need to just... It's a shock. It's, it's something that's just, how do you think? How far are they going to go? <laughs> well, let's pray. Father, we do give thanks to you for men that we can model ourselves after. 
and especially for Jesus Christ. For Paul said he modeled himself, Lord, after you. And so, Lord, help us to have that same kind of diligence, that same kind of commitment, that same kind of love and compassion for those that we minister to. That we might be true representatives, Lord, of you. And as we go forth, Lord, may we indeed be your ambassadors. Doing, Lord, the things that you would like to do and the things that you want to do. May we be the instruments, Lord, through which you can do those things. Even, Lord, as Luke began this book, declaring that in the previous book, he spoke of all that you began both to do and to teach until you ascended. And after that, you continued to work only now through the lives of those men that you had anointed with your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we offer to you our bodies. We offer to you our lives that they might be instruments in your hands that through us, Lord, you can continue to show your love. You can continue to do your work that, Lord, we would be the instruments through which you would reach out and touch and minister to the needy. Lord, may we be everything you would have us to be, a living example of what you are before this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.